in a dim corner of my room. For longer than my fancy thinks, a beautiful and silent sphinx has watched me through the shifting gloom. Inviolate and immobile, she does not rise, she does not stir, for silver moons are not for her, and not to her the suns that reel. Welcome to Digging Up Ancient Aliens. This is the podcast where we examine the TV show Ancient Aliens. Do the claims hold water to an archaeologist or are there better explanations out there? I'm your host Frederick and this is episode 24. Yay! We will continue looking into the claims from uh, episode 4 of season 3 called Aliens and Temples of Gold. You do not need to have heard the first part but I would recommend go back and listen to it when you have time. But this time we will investigate the Sphinx, one of the world's most famous monuments. Some assert that it holds a secret more ancient than the pyramids themselves. We will also hunt for the Holy Grail and treasure in both France and Scotland, visiting René Le Chateau and Roslyn Chapel outside Edinburgh. Remember that you find sources, resources and reading suggestions on our website, diggingupancientaliens.com. They will also find contact info if you notice any mistakes or have any suggestions. If you like the podcast, I would really appreciate if you left one of those very fanciful five-star reviews that I heard exist out there somewhere. Now, when we've finished our preparation, let's dig down into the episode. So let's hop on over to Khafre's Pyramid Complex, just to the side of his father, Khufu. And let's hear the show out again this time around we go over the claims as we hear them so the show takes us back to 1936 and tells us that engineers finally revealed the sand covered statue for the first time in centuries they claim that this process took 11 years to do and we learned that those elitist Egyptologists believe the swings to have been made on the rule of Khafre around uh, 2500 BCE. Could that be the whole truth? Well, Robert Bawal thinks that there's more to the story than we have been told, at least. The orthodox date of about 2500 BCE tagged on these monuments has been challenged by a group of researchers, including myself, who have argued that the erosion of the Sphinx suggests a much, much older Sphinx. And we learned that Egyptologists to this day argue about when and how it was built. So if science cannot agree, could there really be something to Bawal's claims? Could this really be evidence of extraterrestrial visitation? Well, according to Jason Martell, it's most likely. And he brings up examples of animal-headed creatures in Babylonian and Sumerian literature. On the screen we do see examples of this, but uh, these animal-headed creature that Martel thinks are Sumerian, but in reality are genies from the Akkadian empires. Sure, it's the same area, but not really the same culture or <laughs> even kingdom, but but these animal-headed creatures, we're back with uh, Zachariah Sitchin's writing, and they discuss this animal hybrid theories that the alien gold mining race experimented with human-animal hybrids to get a race that would be able to work for them more efficiently. And we saw that when we review <laughs> Ancient Aliens the Game. It should be on YouTube shortly, so check that one out when you have time over. But then... <laughs> The show then uh, hypothesizes that uh, maybe the Sphinx was not intended as just a statue. Maybe it was also meant to be some sort of vault to store all the gold. 
and there are supposedly a lot of tunnels and cave beneath the plateau. And the show brings up the ground penetrating radar has been done over the plateau, revealing uh, caves and tunnels beneath it. And Robert Baval tells us this. A shaft was discovered called the Osirian shaft, which led under the Giza plateau behind the Sphinx. Now in that shaft are various passageways that lead seemingly nowhere from a scientific point of view. I'm not talking about speculation and theories and legends and so forth. That was the very first time that some strong indication that there might be these hidden tunnels and chambers under the Sphinx. And according to this, they found very, very strong evidence of what looked like artificial chambers. Now, according to the show, unspecified ancient texts claim to be elaborate, elaborate depository beneath the Swing's Paw, known only as the Hall of Records. And this is traced back to the destruction of Atlantics. Atlantics, Atlantis, <laughs> where a few survivors emigrated to Egypt and set up their secret library to avoid losing all the records of their technology. This event is thought to have taken place some 12,000 years ago. How they arrived at that date? No idea. Eric von Däniken and Robert Boval explains at least. The Hall of Record, it was made by us, but with the tools and the knowledge of extraterrestrials. It is speculated that a group of survivors of Atlantis came to Egypt at about 10,500 BC, brought along with them their records, their knowledge, and built this storeroom somewhere at Giza. And after more speculation what might be down in the Hall of Records, we will say farewell to Egypt this time around. Except for us, dear listeners, let's let's sort this out. <laughs> well, it's quite of a short section that could have been much longer and maybe more detailed. They are actually missing one expert that I find a bit surprising, but we will get to that in just a moment. Let's rewind to the excavation of the swings. Now it's true that this impressive monument has been covered by sand, as the show says several times, but it was not uncovered in 1939 but actually a couple of years earlier what they did in 1939 was to complete the restoration of the swings today is thought of a quite destructive thing for the monument but the sandstone is of relative poor quality and was falling apart so they restored it with concrete, adding a collar around the neck to stabilize it and trying to fix the headdress. The erosion has, over the centuries, not been kind to the poor Sphinx. Not only has it lost its nose, no, no, Napoleon did not shoot it off with a cannon, but it has also lost its beard. And the age of the Sphinx is not much of an argument among scholars today but it was a different story back in 1800s but i don't think we should use the oldest theories when newer and better research is available they do not spend much time on the age of the Sphinx for some reason they just proclaim it to be 12,000 years old without going into details Bewal is one of the authors who believe that they have evidence for this age even then it's little evidence to support it. This is with the help of Robert Scotch, a geologist who usually appears on the show but is strangely lacking from this episode. But their idea why the Sphinx is much older than we have dated it is due to erosion that's on the back wall of the enclosure. And the erosion is confirmed and is worse on the back wall but as I mentioned the, the whole section is in quite bad shape. Geologists blame this on a combination of wind and sand, but it's also been noted that overnight condensation happens on the Sphinx, leading to capillary action. When the water evaporates in the morning, crystals are formed and flake the stone when they are expanding. But Robert Scotts believed that the erosion could only happen if this section was heavily rained on and therefore needed to have been made in the Neolithic subpluvial. And this rainy era 
began about 14,000 BCE and ended roughly around 550,000 BCE or 5,500 BCE. Now, we should note that the Giza Plateau is uphill and even if Swings is not really a place on the top, it's pretty far up and it would not be an area where water was flowing, so to say, even if it was wetter during the period. To make things worse for Scott's theory, it was still quite humid during the reign of Kefre, and we see this in archaeological records and in depictions of the time, mostly in their arts and how they depict different plants that we don't see in later periods of Egypt. Scotch claimed that it's possible that maybe Kafre reshaped the head during his time, and he has tried to defend his thesis with... Uh, <laughs> with little success. He has tried to change his theory as a criticism has been um, given to him. Much of this comes from uh, KMT or Kemet, a modern journal of ancient Egypt, where Scott publicized his article in the summer issue of 1992. But his arguments and rebuttals have been thoroughly met by other scholars ever since, basically. But how do we know the age of the swings? Well, Professor Salam Hassan did a lot of work outlining when the swings could have been made. For example, we know that it can't be later than the 4th dynasty, since the tombs of the south wall are of that date, and could only have been made after the enclosure was created. If we turn our eyes towards the southwest corner, we note a causeway and a trench that must have been there before the enclosure was created. And this leaves us with a narrow window of when the Sphinx could have been carved. Add to this the archaeological evidence beneath the stones of the enclosure, suggesting the reign of Khafre. So you would need to ignore much of the body of knowledge we have for Scotch theory, theory to work. While science have moved forward regarding both quality of the limestone, its fissures and other things, Scotch and Bowal and Hancock are standing there crossing their arms and trying to ignore all the work that has been done. There's also been luminescence dating of the swings that confirm the dating proposed by Egyptologists. And luminescence dating is when you date a stone from when it was first hit by sunlight. Very interesting technology, a bit out of our scope currently, but we might return to it when we have an expert on that type of stuff. And I think it might be good to note that Robert Scott is building his theory on Edgar Cayes and in part, a bit of Madame Blatsky. The latter is the founder of Theosophy, and the former was known as the Sleeping Prophet. Now, Caius was not described as a man of word. He was next to illiterate. However, he garnered a large crowd around him due to the belief that he had powers of healing and of prediction. Caius was also believed to be able to see past lives in his dreams, and in one of them he described the destruction of Atlantics and the Atlanteans' construction of both the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid. He prophesied that the Hall of Records would be opened in 1998, leading to a new age of wonder. But in Caius didn't mean the release of Britney Spears' Oops, I Did It Again, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, or The Truman Show. I don't think the vault really opened. Most likely since they were an imaginary invention by a proclaimed prophet who mostly slept on his work. <laughs> or maybe these were things that was in the vault. Who knows, but um, I'm skeptical at least. As for the underground chambers beneath the plateau, well, there are fissures and holes around them. Some are from graves. Take, for example, Hetheferus I, mother of Khufu. Khufu moved her grave, Hetheferus, to, uh, to the Giza plateau after, well, probably her grave was robbed. 
and he then com- you know dug it into the bedrock protecting her with his pyramid basically there are more of these so the show is correct but their conclusion that these cavities are the hollow records is still wrong as for the tunnels in the Sphinx, Sai Havas who opened two of them in 1970 described them as follow the first tunnel is located behind the head of the Sphinx, cut into the mother rock about six meters the second tunnel is located in the tail of the Sphinx. We learned of it from Sheikh Mohammed Abd al Magod, who in turn knew this from his grandfather. It too is cut in the mother rock, about 12 meters. We found no significant artifacts inside the tunnel, but the evidence suggests that the tunnels were cut during the Pharaoric period, I believe during 26th dynasty. A third tunnel on the north side of the Sphinx has not been opened since 1926, when Emile Baris opened it. We have photographs showing two workmen inside it. With that, I think we have a good understanding on how we know the age of the swings and why there's no hollow records. So let's head to our following location. From Egypt, we go to France, the village of Rennes-le-Château, and on January 29th, 1953, Marie Dernadud, a frail 85-year woman, lies on her deathbed. Apparently, she was supposed to give the secret location of a treasure, but a stroke left her incapable of speaking or writing. Before Marie's death, she had promised to tell someone the secret. I will tell you the secret, and you will be rich beyond your wildest dreams. And what she said was, the people of this village walk on enough gold to make them wealthy for a hundred years, and they have no idea. And the secret, she was never able to speak it after she had her stroke. So what was Marie talking about? And we learned that his treasure or this treasure comes from the sacking of Rome by the Visigoth. They were returning from their plunder with wealth beyond anyone's imagination. So they stored it here, but it was left behind for some reason when they left the region some 200 years later. The Visigoths were known to have buried treasure with their dead. So Rennes le Chateau became significant because of this idea that there might be gold buried there. And we're getting some confusion here when we meet uh, Berenger Sanger, a local priest of René Le Chateau. And the sh- confusion lies in the fact that the show doesn't really tell you that Marie is the housekeeper of Sanger. The story is that uh, when renovating the church, he came upon the riches hidden by the Visigoth. We then talk about treasure hunting in the region due to these rumors. And Philip Coppens indicate that uh, some have found parts, but um, it must be more out there. The show claims that Father Sonnier talked about encountering this treasure, and it was by pure coincidence and chance. And they described the priest as erratic and claimed that his mental state was affected, affected the decoration of the church. Could it be indication that the priest find maybe something more? Could it be that the treasure was more than just gold? Berger Saunier placed an inscription over the door that people have been talking about for a hundred years. The inscription says, Terribilis est locus iste. It's mistakenly translated most often as this place is terrible. But in fact, the inscription comes from the Old Testament, from the book of Genesis. Jacob has a dream about a ladder that connects heaven to earth, where humans could connect to the divine. So when you look at the Old Testament translation, what it really says is, this place is awesome. Due to this reference, it must be in some sort of stargate, according to uh, William Henry. Philip Coppens says that this area is known for UFO activity. People forget the time and even met the devil. So something must be going on here. 
But again, we we don't go much deeper than that in the show, at least. So all of this sounds like pretty fanciful story about a priest just stumbled upon a Visigoth treasure in Rennes the Chateau. Well, the Visigoths did sack Rome in 410 on their third attempt. And according to Roman sources, they made away with quite a lot of wealth. But the idea that the Visigoths would go and pool all the stolen gold in a cave is a little bit weird. It would have been more realistic if they kept a part of what they took, not storing it in some vault and then forget it when it's time to flee. Now, there are cases where hordes have been found, but they usually tied to a family or you know, a specific house or location. We have several of these treasure, for example, of or treasure hoards on Gotland here in Sweden. There are some discussion on why people did not return and get them, but again, it's treasure on family level. As for the Visigoth graves, they, they did not have many grave goods in them. Some have jewelry, but far from everyone has it, to be honest. They are pretty scarce compared to other culture. And if you humor, humor the idea of wealthy Visigoths, would they not have finer things for their eternal rest? But as with other things, we don't need a gothic treasure to explain how Sanjir got all of the money for the renovation. It boils down to good old-fashioned fraud and swindlery. So Bernier Sanier's sudden wealth did catch the eye of both the church and journalist of the time. He, he not only started a considerable renovation in a small village beyond it, their means, basically, but he also bought several plots of lands and built a renaissance stall villa. So this house was complete with an orangerie and a cage for monkeys and Everything you would want in a French country house. And to avoid at least some suspicion, Sanier put the house in Maurice de Narnaud's name. The Catholic Church did call Sanier to three separate ecclesiastical trials due to his work in René Le Chateau. It, uh, it turns out that uh, he did not really find a Visigoth treasure, but uh, more... More a real treasure in people's gullibility and fear of death. So what uh, Berenger did was to sell mass. This meant that he would hold a mass in someone's name and uh, that way save them some time in hell or purgatory. At this time the Catholic Church somewhat allowed this practice but with restrictions. But Sanier didn't really care about the restriction and sold more than the three allowed masses a day. His accounting book showed that some month he would earn up to 7,000 francs on these sales. And this is a significant amount even today. I hardly believe that it was even a whole sum taken into account as uh, he worked with his brother on some of these selling some of these illicit mass masses. It might be a good to mention also that he had other ventures at the time, which was also accounted for some money that was put into his books. As I mentioned, he his building projects did catch the eye of several people and organization. And the church would be the organization that investigated Bernier Sanier the most. Think about that. The Catholic Church in the early 1900s felt compelled to investigate this accusation. And the church might have let many things slide during its history, but this was a bit too much. So much in fact that the Sanier were in front for the classical court three times, as I mentioned. And the charges were as following. Trafficking in masses. Disobedience to the bishop. Exaggerated and unjustified expenditure to which fees from masses that have not been said seems to have been devoted. 
In his first trial in 1910, Berenger Sanier did not even show up, and he was sentenced in absentia. And it would be more or less the same for the subsequent three trials. For the second trial, he did provide what he claimed to be the total invoices for the church renovation and the building of his villa. It would have cost him about 36,250 francs. But the court noted that he had gathered some 193,000 and 150 francs in donations. Later in the summer, it seems that Sonnier changed his tune and claimed that the building of his villa, Villa Bethania, the house that he built but put in Mary's name, cost him 90,000 francs and the church cost 40,000. The ecclesiastical court ordered him to pay back all the ill gotten funds. And he was sentenced to suspension, removed from priesthood, and during the time of suspension could not administer sacraments. For the f- last few years of Berenger Sanier's life, he continued to sell masses and try to appeal to Rome with what money he did manage to raise. This seems to not have been working, and on uh, 22nd of January 1917, he died. Abbe Jean Riviere performed his last rites and lifted the suspension at the moment of death. His trusty housekeeper Marie de Narnaud ended up paying for a mother's chest and a funeral. And the first to start spreading the rumors about Sanyer's supposed treasure was a restaurant owner named Noel Corbu in the late 1950s. Corbu claimed that the priest had found a map of Blanche of Castile's hidden treasure inside a pillar. It seems as he did this to attract more attention to the village and his business. It's from Noel Corbo we get the story about Marie, who died in 1953. But the story that Noel spread is after her death. Strangely, wonder why. <laughs> Blanche was a French queen in the first half of the 13th century in France. And these stories influenced uh, Pierre Plantard, who used them in his uh, esoteric hoax, uh, Priory of Sion, that in turn was picked up by Gerard de Sud and his book uh, Lord de Rennes. And this book would in turn inspire the, holy, the book <laughs> Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and ancient alien theorists in general. And even if they're their best to try to get a UFO in towards the end, they really didn't succeed in getting a good alien connection in here. Also, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, the source of uh, the Da Vinci Code. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this story did uh, spiral a little bit. And the whole story was straightforward and nobody thought there were treasure until Noel Corbo start to make this up and you know other author incorporated the ideas from his story in their own and suddenly we have Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code. In all of this retelling centered on the conspiracy they strangely left out the um, selling of masses. I can't really find the author bring it up. Uh, the money Sonier did collect we know would have covered both the renovations and We don't really have a mystery here except, you know, man's personal greed in general. So we are leaving France, heading to Edinburgh, Scotland, or at least close to it. Because on top of a hill sits a church, and it's called Roslyn Chapel, formerly known as Collegiate Chapel of St. Matthew. The construction of the church started in 1456 on behalf of William Sinclair. According to the church's original plan, it was supposed to be a cruciform, which basically means it would have been shaped like a cross. And according to the show, the church is supposed to have a secret chamber where Templars hid their gold riches from their excavation upon the Temple Mound. 
William Henry fill us in. Rosalind Chapel is one of the most fascinating possible recreations of Solomon's Temple. It literally is a Holy Grail temple that was constructed by William St. Clair and is designed to be a repository of Holy Grail secrets. When it was created, it had the most wonderful and fantastic symbolism perhaps anywhere in the world. And we covered the idea that the Templars excavated a Temple Mound in Episode 8 when we had Eric Palmgren joining us. So according to this theory, the Templars settled in on the Temple Mound and started excavating. But there are some issues with this theory, as you might suspect. The Templar, or the poor fellow soldiers of Christ and the Temple of Solomon, did have their base on the Temple Mound. But that's why they got the you know, lost part of their name, because they were housed in one of the wings. Baldwin I used the Temple as a palace. But um, so would the Templars. They would take over the upkeep that had been quite terrible. Baldwin preferred lavish food and party to renovation and uh, left the temple in rather poor condition. So when the Templars took over, they had quite a lot to do. Prioritize and fixing the roof and the wall. Eyewitnesses from the time described the renovation, but they do not mention any excavation or retiling of the floor. And they would keep the mound for... Well, not too long, 70 years after uh, they got access to the house uh, or the temple, uh, Saladin would take over the city with the Muslim forces. And the show goes on, wonders if there's a mysterious message and symbol hidden in the church. And that's something that always struck me as quite odd, that every secret society supposedly leave clues out uh, where every, everyone somehow can see them and uh, they are still secret. Uh, today's treasures are found because there was no clues to them. Take the horse on Gotland again, for example. If the owner had carved runestone with riddles everywhere, someone would figure the riddles out sooner or later later and you know find the treasures but we found them because they are so hidden that people either forgot them or nobody else could find them until somebody had a bit amount of luck there and i know it's fun to think that you might be able to stumble into a conspiracy and maybe save the earth and it's natural to you know dream about being the hero in your own story but we should look at this from as some sort of fallacy basically the secret society clue part at least because if we think about it a secret involving many people only works if well most of them are dead <laughs> and the show talks about William Sinclair and how brilliant he was and that it can be seen in how the church was designed it contains elements from across the globe which may be fitting sense in Episode 8, William C. Clare went to Nova Scotia and built a giant wall in the treasure pit, money pit. But um, this time they changed the story and he stay in uh, Scotland instead and hide the treasure here. Except that the Templars had, by William Sinclair's time, been gone for some 200 years. There's some unaccounted history, but all right, all right. We then uh, start to look up towards the ceiling and the show points out there that there are 110 green men up there and they are supposed to have a purpose. Kathleen uh, McGovern Coppens explain. The green man appears in over 110 different locations. As you watch the progression of the green man from east to west, that progression represents the passing of time. So these men, green men, are, as the show explained, Pagan gods, maybe. But that sounds a bit anachronistic since pagan gods had long been gone from England. The name Green Men actually orig originates in more recent times. And this term was coined in 1939 by Lady Raglan. She wrote this in an article in the papal folklore. And she uh, seems to have made it up more on a whim than on a scholarly reason so the show's idea that it's a common word for fairy is a late invention it was 
invented in 1939. But these heads are among, at least, academical, uh, usually known as foliated heads, originating from Roman tomb. So this is a known Roman decorative feature that spread across France, Spain, Spain, and lastly, Britain. And these elements became popular again during the Romanesque period, and since then was a typical church decoration. As for the idea that the faces turn older the further you go into the church seems to be a question of taste or imagination, maybe. I can't really see it in the photo the photos available to me, but um, there are not only men among the faces, there are examples of women too. The writers think that these faces somehow have to do something with the grail. The connection, though, is quite weak. And it shows the things that they thoroughly ex- establish that this would be the location of the Holy Grail. But um, where would the Grail be placed in the church? So the place presented is a unique pillar called the Apprentice Pillar. And the show claims that this pillar is notable because a man went into the church and tried to cut it down. We're also told that it closely resembles a DNA strand. But how would the people of the time know what DNA even looked like? So the pillar in question is real and it goes under a few names, but most commonly is known as the Apprentice Pillar. And the name originates from a story where a master mason went to Rome with uh, Sinclair's patronship to study architecture. In the meantime, the apprentice had a dream uh, where he carved the pillar and he went and carved it as in his dream. And when the master mason came back and saw the amazing craftsmanship, he got so envious that he killed the apprentice. And for that crime... The master was hanged, and according to some accounts, the two of the green men represent the apprentice and uh, the master mason. It's a fanciful story, not likely true. Uh, the reason why the pillar is different to all the others is it was part of Sinclair's original cruciform plan. As I mentioned, he had envisioned this as a different in a different shape and the pillar would have uh, if they had followed his plan the pillar would have been where the head of christ would have been on the cross basically but his plan didn't really pay out so the whole story about sinclair's masterful uh, <laughs> design of the church just falls apart right there basically as for the helix the dna has two strands the pillar has three looking at the pillar we see Some art seems to fit into a more religious narrative. On the south side of the pillar, we have the sacrifice of Isaac. Again, connecting it to the Jesus of the cross. By the foot, we see dragon entangled with what seems to be dead leaves. Yeah, as I mentioned, the pillar more likely has to do something with sacrifice or sacrifice of Christ. For sure, it's not the resting place of the Holy Grail. And it might be good to mention, again, that the today, what we see today is a reconstruction from 1862. The church was abandoned in 1592 after the altar was destroyed. So it was in rather poor condition when the Queen of uh, 1840 visited and wanted it restored. Vowed a secret cabal let the site, they swore to protect just decay. If it was my secret order, eh, it wouldn't, but eh, I don't have one, so I guess I don't have much to say about it. But the show ends with this quote from Succulus. The whole story is very fascinating to the ancient astronaut theory. Wolfram von Eschenbach, for example, suggests that the Holy Grail arrived from the stars. And the question is, what did he mean by that? It is often described as this vessel that had blinking red lights. Were the Templar in possession of some technological device? So in Wolfram von Echenbach Parzival, the author portrays the grail as a gemstone or a stone with different colors. 
And there is an idea that the stone come from the sky, but it could also be a part in the story where a dove comes down on Good Friday to give power to the stone. I could not really find an exact passage where the stone were falling from the sky, but it's clear from the description it does not blink or behave like a machine. Again, Giorgio claims something that he hoped that you won't go and look up really. And there we have it. The alien temples of gold nicely wrapped up. I, I felt that this episode was quite weak and... Well, I kind of lost their alien connection towards the end, especially the hunt for the Holy Grail. I I see what they want to get at there, that the Holy Grail maybe isn't a chalice of gold. Maybe it's the bloodline of Jesus, you know, from Holy Grail, Holy Blood, or Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Anyway, <laughs> and that this bloodline, though, is alien. But they never really brought that part up. They just brought up that, hey, this could be the grail, and then we just left it hanging a little bit. As evidence of alien interference in our history, I give this episode a 1. So let's see what they manage to bring up next time. But remember to leave a positive review anywhere you can, such as iTunes, Spotify, or to your friend at the trench. I would also recommend visiting diggingupancientaliens.com to find more info about me and the podcast. You will also find me on most social media sites and if you have comments, corrections, suggestions or you just want to write a very angry email in all caps, you find my contact info at the website. You will also find the sources and resources that I use to create this episode and um, you will also find further reading suggestions if you want to learn more about what we talked about today. Sandra Martelor created the intro music, and our outro music is written, performed, and sung by a band called Tradskruv, who will sing us out with their song Tinfoil Head. Links to both of these artists will be found in the show notes. Until next time, keep showing that science. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in and listening to this episode. Remember that we have a subscription going on. You can become a patron or other subscriber for as little as $2.50 per episode. Go to diggingupancientaliens.com slash support. That is, go to diggingupancientaliens.com slash support to read more information and sign up right there. 